Um, colleagues and panelists, if you could please turn your cameras on, uh, as long as you're not having bandwidth issues. Baltimore City Council Ways and Means Committee, we're here today for Council Resolution 21-0062R, American Rescue Plan Quarterly Hearing. Um, Marguerite, can you please make sure to uh, elevate uh, Council President Mosby if he's not already? He's already in oh, chairman. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, um, okay, there he is, excellent. Uh, I'm Eric Costello, Councilman for the 11th District, Chair of the Committee. I'm joined today uh, in no specific order by Councilwoman Felicia Porter, 10th District, Council President Nick Mosby, uh, Councilwoman, or Council Vice President Sharon Milton, uh, 6th District Member of the Committee, Councilman Chris Burnett, 8th District Member of the Committee, Councilman Robert Stokes, 12th District Member of the Committee. Uh, on behalf of uh, Mayor Brandon Scott is Natasha Mihu, and on behalf of Council President Nick Mosby is Matt Stegman and Nikki Thompson. Marguerite Curran is on. She is staff to the committee. Uh, before we begin, uh, Mr. President, I want to turn it over to you to int for introductory remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, but I'm okay. Um, you know, I look forward to uh, a, um, a productive hearing today, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, and for your leadership in, in uh, getting this resolution together and in these hearings started. Do appreciate it, sir. Uh, Director Kearney, uh, we're going to turn it over to you. We understand you have a presentation for us. I do, and before I start the presentation, um, just a few opening remarks. Um, first, a good morning to all members of the council, um, and I'm Shamaya Kearney. I am the Chief Recovery Officer for the Mayor's Office of Recovery Programs. Um, I'd first like to thank Mayor Scott and CAO Shorter for entrusting me with the responsibility for leading this effort. I also would like to take the time to thank my incredible team in the Mayor's Office of Recovery Programs, who despite the negative tone and tenor for which our office is often discussed, continue to keep their heads down to do the work, um, will not always be able to respond or rebut every misleading or patently false statement that's made, but in the end, our work will speak for us. I also want to thank you, Councilmember Costello, for providing me with an opportunity to separate the facts from fiction. Um, as everyone that often speaks about ARPA or proposes ideas about ARPA don't necessarily understand and know the allowable uses of those funds per the law. So I greatly appreciate the opportunity that you provided uh, and the direct dialogue that you and I have had, and it feels like that's a practice that um, seems to have gone away in this day and age. So thank you so much for the opportunity to always dialogue. Um, I also wanna take a moment to speak directly to the residents of Baltimore City. Uh, the Scott administration is focused on the efficient and strategic implementation of American Rescue Plan Act funding, uh, but it will not be easy and it will not be quick. Uh, the challenging aspects of implementing the law and the use of these funds are evidenced by the 151 pages of the law, in addition to the 33 pages of accompanying reporting guidance. Uh, the city had great needs before the pandemic and those needs have been further exacerbated as a result of the pandemic. We know and understand that $641 million will not solve all of these needs, but strategic planning and strategic investment can put the city back on the right path. The investment decisions that the city faces are difficult ones. However, cities and states across the country are also grappling with how best to maximize ARPA funding and the city of Baltimore is not unique in that challenge. Do not let anyone at any level of government tell you otherwise. It's challenging across this country. Uh, the administration's primary goals are one, to wisely invest ARPA funding for the benefit of Baltimore City residents, which includes adhering to eligible uses of funds per the law, and two, to not spend these funds on ineligible uses per the law, as any funds that are spent uh, that are determined to be ineligible uses, again, must be repaid to the federal government. So every idea or proposal that's discussed in the public domain does not equate to eligible uses under the law. A Baltimore City already had a challenging financial environment, and I would be derelict in my duties as a chief recovery officer to put the city in an even more challenging situation by allowing funds to be used for ineligible purposes. Uh, to be clear, 
The Scott administration is working hard to ensure that ARPA funds are strategically invested and yielding maximum benefits for the residents of the city of Baltimore. There will always be competing interests and competing ideas on how best to do that, both internal and external to city government. But even with those competing interests, while we may not always agree on approach, the one thing that we should all agree on is seeing a better Baltimore. So with that, I'll start my formal presentation. Tasha, if you can bring those up, please. So just as a, a little bit of um, refresher, the, the original intent of these hearings was to talk about uh, the reports that we would be submitting to the United States Department of Treasury um, in our quarterly reports. Um, it's important to note that there that the original quarterly report was due on October the 31st. Uh, however, Treasury changed its guidance and did not require an October 31st report. Um, instead, they have moved that rec reporting requirement to uh, January 31st of 2022. Um, so this hearing uh, will not focus on expenditures and things of that nature, but instead I'll give a little bit of a background and understanding of the reporting requirements um, and then open it up to the council for additional questions that, um, that you might have. So with that, I'll go into the next slide, please. So I also wanted to start off with a little bit of information around the roles and responsibilities of the recovery office versus those of our agencies. So the Mayor's Office of Recovery Programs is responsible for strategic planning, monitoring, and tracking of ARPA-related projects. Um, our agencies are responsible for implementation and execution. So while we continue to coordinate and review the evaluation and project proposals, um, which include looking at eligibility of those proposals per the law, uh, we engage with our internal and external stakeholders um, in the public about eligible uses, uh, facilitate the application process, develop implementation plans and performance measures in coordination with agencies. Uh, we provide information to the mayor and CAO to inform funding decisions. Uh, we communicate those decisions and results. Uh, we eventually, once we get uh, start to fund programs, we'll communicate those results of those programs that have been funded through ARPA. Uh, we will monitor and track performance and expenditures through the project life cycle. And uh, again, we're also responsible for providing the required reports to Treasury. Uh, for our agencies, again, our agencies are responsible for implementation and execution. Um, so they are responsible for designing their ARPA funded programs and initiatives, um, engaging with any city agencies or external organizations that may be needed to provide assistance with implementation, uh, actually implementing those programs and initiatives that are funded by ARPA, um, ensuring that they are monitoring any subrecipient spending and performance, and providing that information to the Office of Recovery Programs so that we can provide that information to the Department of Treasury. Next slide. Next slide. Raven. So there are three kind of primary purposes of the Treasury reporting um, to ensure that ARPA funds are used for, are not used for ineligible purposes and there's no waste, fraud, or abuse. Uh, the swift, effective implementation of funding while also balancing uh, and facilitating simple and rapid program access and maintaining a robust documentation and compliance regime. And then lastly, ensuring transparency and public ac accountability of the use of ARPA funds. Next slide. So again, just noting that the original project and expenditure report was due on October the 31st. It is now due on January the 31st. Um, our quarterly reports are due 30 days after the end of every quarter. Uh, and those reports are to contain financial information for any types of projects that are funded um, or any information on contracts and grants and subawards over $50,000. And then there's a breakdown of the elements of our project and expenditure reports that have to include um, the elements that are included on the slide. And I'll talk a little bit about those individually. For example, for our project inventory, the information needs to include 50 to 250 word description of major activities that are occurring on the project and the status of completion. Uh, the status of completion varies from not started to completed or completed less than 50% or completed more than 50%. Uh, those reports also require project demographic distribution. 
So in those reports, we need to identify whether or not our project is serving an economically disadvantaged community. Um, those are generally described as those that are located in a qualified census tract uh, or, in t or uh, benefit individuals that primarily live in a qualified census tract. Uh, that primary beneficiaries that earn less than 60% of median income or over 25% of intended beneficiaries are below the poverty line. Uh, also for sub awards, we have to provide information on obligations and expenditures, um, again, that are uh, equal to or greater than $50,000. We also have to provide information on the period of performance, those start and end dates, uh, obligation amounts, uh, expenditure amounts, what the projects are, and various programmatic performance indicators. Uh, programmatic data for non-infrastructure projects, we also must provide information, very detailed level information on the location. Again, expenditure data, if it's for any water, sewer, or broadband projects, over $10 million. We must also provide information on employees, contractors, third-party hires, wage and benefits, um, there's a variety of information that has to be provided um, as a part of those uh, treasury reports. Next slide, please. Um, and so in terms of treasury reporting requirements, we kind of break those down into three areas. So it's the program measures. Um, I identified in a prior testimony that we are working with individual agencies and eventually nonprofits on developing performance measures that will be used to track the progress of their uh, projects that are funded through ARPA to make sure that we are getting a return on investment. Uh, there are mandatory uh, treasury measures also for a variety of areas that are also included on this slide. Um, I won't name them all, but a, a few are household assistance, small business and economic assistance, things of that nature. And in addition, there are also the financial measures, which we talked a little bit about on the prior slide. Next slide. Uh, so now that I've kind of given an overview of what is uh, kind of the, the characteristics of the treasury reports that we have to provide on a quarterly basis and also an annual report, I um, also want to talk a little bit about the, the uses of funds in addition uh, to give a little bit of an overview of proposal status for the proposals that our office has received to date. Um, just again, want to remind, and this quote comes directly from the legislation, um, that the interim final rule provides that payments from the fiscal recovery fund should be designed to address an economic harm resulting from or exacerbated by the public health emergency. And so as we continue to have conversations about what types of proposals we're funding, we are con consistently keeping in mind that there must be a tie to the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. Uh, so these are the eligible funding uses, uh, public health, economic impact, premium pay, revenue loss, and broadband water and sewer infrastructure. Again, those are the primary categories that are included in the interim final rule per the Department of Treasury. Next slide. So I'm providing a little bit of an overview of um, the proposal we have received in our office. So one of the things that the Treasury guidance also outlines are expenditure categories. So I've mentioned in prior slides that we are responsible for providing information on expenditures. And these are the seven categories that those expenditures are broken down by for reporting purposes. That's public health, negative economic impacts, services to disproportionately impact the communities, premium pay, infrastructure, again, that's water store broadband, revenue replacement, and also administrative. Uh, the great majority of the proposals that we've received from city agencies and nonprofits um, have been categorized as public health. Um, and you can see on this, uh, the table over to the right, uh, that's a little bit of a breakdown um, of how those proposals, uh, the categories or expenditure categories that they are aligned with. Next slide, please. So to date, we've received 191 proposals that's both from nonprofits and from city agencies. Uh, about 179 of those proposals have been reviewed for eligibility. Uh, we have about 53% of those proposals that have been deemed eligible per the law. And again, um, I provided kind of that information and that breakdown on what is considered eligible. Uh, the primary reasons for ineligibility have been that there has been no direct relationship to COVID-19 um, or its economic impacts, or there's not a valid expenditure category per the Treasury guidance. And those are the categories that I just went over on the prior slide. 
Um, when we look at this information broken down by mayoral pillars, uh, we find that the majority of the proposals that we've received thus far have fallen under the responsible stewardship of city resources pillar. Next slide. So again, this is a, a fairly short presentation because uh, there was no report that was due to the Department of Treasury for this quarter, uh, but happy to answer any questions that the council members may have. Thank you, Director. Uh, Mr. President, any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, thank you, uh, Director Kearney. Um, regarding the uh, nonprofit uh, panel and the, um, the group that's going to be set up to kind of evaluate uh, the organization, I believe uh, we asked on the last call um, the makeup of that board. Um, the, the concern that was brought up was that some of the nonprofits that would ultimately be requesting money through uh, the portal and through the process would also have representation on um, that panel. Is that still the case? Uh, and have you guys um, developed what the makeup is, like who actually and what from, from what organization is sitting on that panel? So we provided that information in our responses to the council from the last hearing, uh, what the makeup and breakdown is of those, uh, of the various departments and organizations that are serving on that panel. Um, don't have those in front of me, but we did provide that information. Uh, I think your second question was about if we, we so we still have nonprofits that are a part of the, the review panel. Uh, what we also noted was that we have alternates. And so in those cases, if we have individuals that are serving on the panel and if their organization or an organization that is affiliated with them uh, has a proposal that needs to be reviewed, they would recuse themselves and we would then use our alternate to review uh, that proposal and score. Yeah, I think the concern was why didn't we just develop an independent body that had no relationship to access of applying for the grants? I think that so, that was the, that was the the concern of the council, and that was the ask of the council of the recovery office. So we had already established what the makeup of it would be. We didn't see that as a issue because we have addressed any challenges. Um, in terms of conflict of interest by making sure that we had alternates. Um, I mean, I mean the, our, ultimate, the ultimate thing is an interesting kind of concept, but if I'm sitting on a panel and I'm reviewing hundreds and hundreds of applications with other individuals, and then when it comes time for my application to be reviewed, I somehow step out of the room and there's a replacement that steps in the room to review my application. It just seems like a very strange type of way of going um, down this road. So again, I, I just want to stress, I think the council's opinion was that that board, that body, um, be made up specifically of individuals who had no relationship or want or need to go after uh, this money for their organization. I, I'm not following uh, why that's why the use of an alternate would be a challenge. Um, we address that any conflict of interest and that's why we have an alternate. Um, certainly, I agree with you that it, it would not be right or proper or in order to have a member of an organization that's applying for funds also reviewing their own application. Um, so the use of the alternate is is for that purpose. And so I'm not, and it's not an uncommon concept to have a use of alternates um, when there are conflicts of interest. So I, I guess I'm just not following why the use of alternates is still not a sufficient process. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just going down the path of why not set an independent body where you know that there would not be any conflicts from the start. I mean, obviously, there's charging orders from the mayor. Um, there is pillars in which you guys have established of how you wanted to grade this. I guess the, the, the council's position was why not just develop an independent body of folks that have the subject matter expertise uh, to deliver the mayor's needs but have zero conflict associated with any of the application that's coming through because they're ultimately not applying for the same pool of money. You're but assuming I, that, that there's a conflict. Um, so I, I just, we, we see- Oh, so, so, so there's a possibility that none of the organizations that there will not be a conflict. Is that what you're saying? I thought we were saying that, I thought there was definite that we knew that when I asked the question the first time, that we knew that many organizations were going to also apply for the money, but we were going to develop a solution uh, that was not going to put them in the uh, 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 issue of having a conflict of interest. So at the time that the process was developed, we did not know who was going to uh, apply for funding. 
And so in the absence of knowing which organizations would be applying for funding, we developed a process that if a conflict of interest arose, that we would then use an alternate as an individual who would be able to score and not be a part of the process because their organization was not applying for funding. I mean, I, I hear you and I, I appreciate it. I, I think that the administration has taken this approach and it's fine. Uh, just thought it was important to uh, kind of highlight uh, some concerns there. Um, regarding the dashboard from a transparency perspective with the public, uh, is there a time frame in which it's going to be available? So, uh, Council President, as you well know, there has not been any funding that has been um, spent to date. No funds have been dispersed. There have only been commitments at this time to agencies. Uh, and so, yes, there will be a dashboard, but in terms of a time frame, that's all going to be entirely contingent upon when we start to disperse funding. Okay, so the dashboard is only going to be with for information about money that's gone out the door. The bet the dashboard is not going to have any transparency, any data associated uh, with the work of your organization, the application that are coming through your organization, the buckets in which applications are coming in, it's not going to have any disaggregated data associated with the application process. It's only going to be post-approval and money out the door. So the answer to that is yes and no. So we have already put on our, um, on our website, we have information around the number of applications that we've received in addition to the number that have been reviewed and the number that have been scored eligible. Uh, right now, we are still in the process of kind of defining how we might be able to provide additional information in a dashboard context. Uh, but so we'll have the, that information as well as the financial information. At some point, we will also have information on performance measures. But again, all of those things are post award, which we have not awarded any funding yet. Yeah, understood. I was talking about all the pre stuff. It's, so again, just to understand, I know that there's different places you can get certain information. But I guess what I'm asking is, it's my expectation that all of that will be in that dashboard. And if so, when do we expect to launch the dashboard? I think from what you originally said is, the dashboard would not be launched until after money's out the door. Is that right? That was the expectation with regard to financial information. If you're talking about specific to application information or proposals, then yes, we can add that information to the website, but we are in the process of, of figuring out the best way to um, to display that information. And so those are conversations that we're having internally with city agencies as well as our IT counterparts. And so we don't have a, a deadline per se for when we wanna do that. What I care most about is that the information is transparent and understandable. Um, and so we've been working through that process. Okay, well, uh, Director Kearney, whenever uh, you guys are able to work with the agencies to figure out uh, when you expect to launch the dashboard, just would like, if you could inform us so we can get the information out to the general public. Yep. Um, uh, this is my last question uh, for this round, Mr. Chair, if that's okay. All right, thank you so much. Um, are you tracking project proposal submissions citywide to ensure that it's not like a concentration of certain projects um, or certain entities um, and showing that equitable geographical spread? So when you say citywide, are you speaking specifically to the $641 million that the city received, or are you talking about all ARPA funding, regardless of who received it? In the city, if for other city agencies that may have received direct allocations from the state or other places? No, just, just the money that the recovery office is managing. Okay, so yes, we are paying attention to that again right now because they're, um, we're still in commitment phase. We have uh, several of our organizations that are still in the process of doing some program design but yes, we will be keeping an eye on um, equitable distribution uh, as well as geography. And my assumption is the dashboard is only gonna be associated with the money that the recovery office is, and the projects that the recovery office are reviewing and expending money out to. Is that correct? Yes, it would only be inclusive of the money that the $641 million that the city is responsible for. That's correct. Um, although gotcha. we have had some conversations with city schools around the ability to um, maybe connect some of their spending as well, but those are very early conversations. Thank you. And I, I know that you you kind of said this earlier, but how many nonprofits um, have been reviewed and scored to date? One second, let me pull that up. Twenty-eight. 
28. And and that's out of, out of how many um, applications so far? 191. 191. All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we've also been joined by, in no specific order, Councilwoman Danielle McCrae, second district member of the committee, Councilwoman Odette Ramos, 14th district, Councilman Isaac Yitzi Schleifer, fifth district member of the committee, Councilman Ryan Dorsey, third district member of the committee. Um, Director Gardner, can you please go back to, uh, or Kearney, oh my goodness, I'm sorry. That's a, Director Kearney. Uh, can you please go back to um, uh, slide number two? Um, Natasha was controlling the slide. Are you still there? Oh, yeah, Natasha, can you jump back to number two? Perfect. Um, I'm just curious, was there, was there any um, – I know that agencies have sent in – proposals. I'm assuming that those proposals have been unsolicited. That's correct. Okay. So we haven't put out an official call to city agencies yet to apply for um, well, projects. Let, let me back up and make sure I'm clear on what you mean by unsolicited. If you mean, did we talk to specific agencies and say you need to provide a proposal on X? No, that has not happened. If you mean notification that the application portal is open and you can submit your proposals in this portal, yes, we have done that. And that happened even before I took this position. Got it. And then do we know if there was any guidance provided to the agencies as to what was eligible versus ineligible? So I do know that there were some early presentations probably in the maybe May and June timeframe um, to talk about eligible uses. And then we also had a briefing once I started in August that also provided a, a briefing to agency directors with that information. Okay, so the reason I'm asking is just because of the number of agency proposals that have been deemed ineligible, which I have no doubt they are in fact ineligible, um, says to me that Perhaps there's a misunderstanding on the part of the agencies as to what is eligible versus what is not. So I'm wondering if if it may make sense to reach out to the agencies to um, take another shot at, at educating them as to you know what would be a good use of their time to pursue versus what mm -hmm. would not. Yes. Um, um, so. so Yes, we, we will continue to, to reach out and engage with our city agencies. We also have a number of one pages that we've added to our website with frequently asked questions. Those are both for nonprofit and for city agencies. Um, we also have uh, many city agencies that contact us directly and we have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them about their proposals. If there were things that were deemed ineligible, we explained the reason why. Um, I think the primary challenge that we see in our agency proposals are that, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, that uh, the city had a lot of need prior to the pandemic. And so it's really um, so that some of the proposals are seeking to address things that were pre-pandemic. Um, and so we have to be very careful about how we, the extent to which we fund things that were already a problem before the pandemic, but if they were further exacerbated by the pandemic, then that is something that would be considered eligible. So it's really making that tie, and in some cases that tie is not there. Uh, and so that would then um, make a proposal ineligible. But again, we do have dialogue with agencies that are in feedback and provide that information to them. So that that's very helpful context. Um, I think it would be, well, let me take a step back. I think there's some confusion that exists within agencies, mm -hmm. um, especially at the leadership level. And you may consider either your office or government relations or whomever, the administration may consider uh, doing additional outreach and education. Yes. Um, because again, there, there seems to be a high volume of projects that 
or proposals that have been denied because they are in fact ineligible, but the agencies simply aren't um, aware of, of that, right? Um, so I'll just, you know, again, the administration may consider doing that. Um, I understand it. Yep, I appreciate it. And then uh, Natasha, can we jump to um, slide eight, please? Thank you. That would be seven. That would be, that's eight. I, maybe I had the wrong number. Um, actually, go back to eight, please, and thank you. Okay. Um, the interim final rule provides that payments um, from these funds should be designed to address an economic harm resulting from or exacerbated by the public health emergency. Um, Director, I, I'm just curious, and, and I know we've spent a great deal of time talking about this both, both publicly and in our private conversations about um, my desire to see the backlog of, of city services um, reduced. I know that the mayor has made some progress on that since he's come into office, but I know that we would all like to see additional progress on that. Are you of the opinion that the backlog of city services that specifically city services where the backlog has been exasperated by um, employee shortages due to COVID-19 or uh, you know work from home policies as related as related to COVID-19 that those that is spending that would be eligible under ARPA? Um, I think it depends on the situation and the circumstance and the degree to which we can demonstrate through data that we had a backlog that again got worse as a result of the pandemic. So to your point about um, shortages in labor and things of that nature, if we're able to show that in data, I think that yes, we would be able to make um, a, a valid case for um, that as being an eligible use. I think if we are unable to be able to demonstrate through data um, that labor shortages or any other situation that may uh, look as though it, it's made that situation worse as a result of the pandemic, then I would consider that to be ineligible. But I do think that it's a case by case basis, but I think it is important to be able to show information pre and post pandemic to be able to make the business case. Got it. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful. Um, Natasha, can you please take down the uh, presentation? Thank you very much. Okay, um, Council Vice President Middleton. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> uh, just to add to the questioning on guidance to agencies, um, and this is first directed to you, Mr. Chair, was the city administrator invited to this meeting? Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Man Madam Vice President, uh, I don't believe, B bear with me one minute. Can you go to your next question and then I'm gonna pull up the uh, specific language from the resolution. Um, I guess it was just mainly around that guidance to agencies and um, I, I feel that part of that responsibility goes towards our new city administrator and working with uh, the agency heads and especially when we're dealing with a large amount of money um, I just th I just I think it's important that he attends these meetings and if he was invited I'd like to know why he's not here and that's the only question that I think that's a very important question. And uh, that's all I have. So we, um, so the, the resolution itself was referred to the city solicitor, finance, the city administrator, and the mayor's office of recovery programs, um, which is obviously director Kearney. So I know that we do have finance on the call with Mara and I'm assuming we've got someone from law. So I guess I'll direct this to Natasha. Was there 
contact or a reason why our city solicitor is not with us? Um, thank you, uh, VP Middleton. To my understanding, um, in discussions leading up to today's um, briefing, uh, the plan was for the recovery office to present. Um, there wasn't discussion on specifically having the um, city administrator here for each of these hearings. Um, if there's an interest in having him here in the future, we'd be happy to um, talk with the office and make sure he's present for the hearings. Um, but at least for this one in particular, um, that wasn't the understanding coming into the hearing. Okay. And I just saw something popped up that said he was invited. So, so I'm... So I'm just, VP, you know, part part of that's on, or if I may, Madam VP, I think part of that is is on me, and and I would be responsible for for the fact that he's not here, or rather, um, the fact that that clear direction wasn't provided to the administration on that specific point, because I did have an opportunity um, to meet with the director this past week, um, in light of the fact that there wasn't going to be a quarterly report that was required by the federal government. So the federal government basically just said no one has to report this period and it's not gonna be like a makeup date, like, okay, report in two weeks. They're just skipping uh, the entire quarterly um, report. Um, but your point is extremely valid as always. And um, what I'd like to do is connect with um, the council president's office and specifically with the council president about that, about, you know, and we'll get that figured out and we'll make sure that that's communicated very clearly to the administration moving forward. Um, but in all fairness, I would say part of that is is on me um, for him not being here, so. Okay, but I just feel that that position, especially since it's new, plays a key role in um, making that communication happen with agent, you know, with all the different agencies and momentum going are there have there been meetings with him and these agencies specifically dealing with ARPA? I know um, uh, Director Kearney has a is you know working detailed uh, implementing the the actual program, but the charge should be with the city administrator, at least in my eyes, with the city administrator in making sure the communication happens between all these agencies that are involved in the guidance of, of the agencies. Um, and I'll stop right there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Vice President. I'll be back in one second. Hang tight. And I just want to add while he we're waiting that, you know, Director Kearney, I know that you, you know, you you have a lot of weight on your, you and your team and you're dealing directly with, um, you know, the implementation piece, but this, this other added piece in trying to keep these agencies um, guided and doing the right thing needs to come from the city administrator and um, I really think he should have been here. Um, I know our chair is uh, just trying to keep things in order, but it's just, um, it's not fair. It's not fair to you and it's not fair to us. And he should have a presence and he should be, because it's showing to us as a council that he is not working with the agencies and I don't want to feel that way and he needs to be attending these meetings to share what his office is doing with the other agencies in reference to this um, plan. I, and I appreciate those comments and thank you for the acknowledgement of, of how hard um, this office is working. I, I've mentioned to you privately that sometimes I think that that gets lost in um, the public discourse and dialogue about this office. So I appreciate you um, giving light to that. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of the, the CAO, I'm, I'm, I am positive that had he known that uh, there was a request or a desire for him to be here that he would have been. Um, and so 
I, I think that now that that has been made clear, I, I'm certain that he'll be present. Yeah, and I think what we'll do um, moving forward, Matt VP, thanks again for raising this point. Um, why don't we plan on touching base about, you know, a month before the next hearing, the next quarterly, and Matt VP, you and I can connect with, with the president and if there's a need um, to have the CAO there, we can communicate that back to government relations and they, they can handle it from there. Does that sound yeah, like a I, action? I think it's especially important since we're talking about the guidance to other agencies because he's specifically in charge of the agencies. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councilman Stokes? I have no questions. I'm just learning the process. Some of the questions that were asked or already asked by VP Milton and uh, Council President. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilwoman McCray. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do not have any questions at this time. Thank you, Councilman Schleifer. No questions at this time. Thank you. Councilman Burnett. I do, and, I, and apologies for my camera. I'm trying to make sure I can stay on um, uh, the uh, the feed. Uh, the question I had uh, quickly was, uh, we, we've started to get feedback around uh, the uh, smaller, the, sort of the nonprofit pot of money, and uh, a lot of the guidance that's been pushed out is that there's, you know, sort of a, a minimum project size of 250000 uh, which sort of box, has been boxing out uh, some of these smaller organizations that uh, may not have a project at that scale. Um, and, you know, they've been, my understanding is that they've been encouraged to um, partner with larger organizations on projects. Uh, is there additional guidance or um, uh, support to potentially create partnerships or encourage partnerships or uh, assist with capacity building for project development, Any, anything of, of those sorts um, that's been taking place to try and help some of these smaller groups that, that may not be able to operate at that scale, but were very much impacted by the pandemic. Thank you for the question, Council Member Burnett. Um, so you may recall that on September the 28th of this year, we held a training with four nonprofit organizations to provide them with information on our process. Um, it's important to note that that was not mandatory or required uh, per the United States Department of Treasury or anyone else. That was a voluntary training that our office put on to help ensure that our nonprofit organizations understand uh, the elements of the law and um, its eligible uses. Um, yes, the minimum requirement is $250,000. We have encouraged um, our organizations to partner with each other um, if they felt that $250,000 was not an amount that their organization could absorb. I would note that although $250,000 is the minimum requirement, that is over the life of the project. So that's not for one year, that's for uh, the duration of the project. So in some cases, um, I'm not sure how some of our nonprofits are interpreting that, but in some cases that really could equate to, um, you know, $50,000 or uh, $60,000, $75,000 a year, um, if you look at it in terms of totality over the life of the project. Uh, we have also worked with our Maryland nonprofit organization to make sure that we're pushing out information. And as a part of our uh, economic recovery fund, um, we will be providing some technical assistance to nonprofits as well. Um, to answer your question specifically about whether we are doing anything um, around helping organizations partner, um, nothing outside of the guidance that we've already provided um, and ensuring that if we hear of organizations that have similar ideals, um, or have expressed concerns about their inability to uh, spend that amount of money within the time period that the law allows, that we will uh, help partner those organizations together if those proposals come to us or if those uh, ask or uh, questions come to us, we will try to partner those organizations together so that they can then determine and figure out if there is a partnership there. Got it. And, and as a, a quick follow up on that. Has there been, um, and, and I'm not sure how it fits into the Treasury guidance, but is, is there consideration to do multiple rounds for the nonprofits? Um, or is that is that feasible in any way? Because uh, perhaps 
the timeline may be a little bit tight for partnerships. Um, but if there was, you know, another round next year or the following year that uh, folks could, you know, have a little bit more time on the back end to, to develop proposals, is there, is there consideration to doing multiple rounds of this? So at this time, there there hasn't been consideration about multiple rounds. I think one of the things that we've talked about in prior council hearings is our desire to really move the money as, as quickly as we can, but also as efficiently as we can, so that then we can really move from disbursement to actual monitoring and tracking um, the performance and how we're spending on these projects. At that time, I think if we're able, if we see an underspend in certain areas, I think then we will look to reallocate those funds and perhaps maybe then we would make additional funding available to nonprofits. But that's, um, I'm, I can't say that with certainty at this time, um, but the original question, no, there hasn't been um, an idea around multiple funding rounds, but I think we will continue to monitor the tracking and then make some decisions based on that. Okay. Yeah, I would I would just say if it's possible to to, to keep that in mind. Um, you know, we, we when we had the, the the first iteration of the youth fund, for example, um, there were there was some a lot of the feedback that we got from the the folks that oversee that fund was that they, they did have to spend uh, a tremendous amount of time on sort of the capacity building side of the work and also just, you know, obviously learning it was, a, you know, similarly a new concept, a new fund. Um, and so there were things that were learned from that first round that they were to make they're able to make alterations to the process to better accommodate, uh, you know, smaller community based organizations in future rounds. And so just something that I think should be considered as we move forward. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Dorsey. Thank you, Mr. Chair, no questions. Thank you. Councilwoman Ramos. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have some questions. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Um, in line with what my colleague was just talking about, um, I'm really glad to hear that there is going to be some technical assistance because the application is really hard. <laughs> and I realized that you had to use the uh, language, I think, from the federal government in some of these applications. Um, so I do hope that we're able to get more of our um, nonprofits to be able to apply, because 28 seems low to me, given the number. Um, but also, it's an equity issue relative to making sure that those that are working in areas where that's toughest and may not have the capacity also have the opportunity. So I'm glad to hear that there will be some technical assistance. I was wondering, in that vein, are there uh, is your office also um, maybe connect? You know, seeing oh, this 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 entity wants to do this, and it fits in with what this agency wants to do, and try to put them together because I noticed that some of the initial announcements that were made was that you know an agency plus nonprofits were put together to have this broader impact and so I'm wondering if you're still doing that um, for something that may not be as broadly announced but is an important um, piece so that uh, there's that connection. Absolutely we are as we receive proposals from nonprofit organizations as well as from city agencies if there are similar ideals or it appears that maybe similar populations are being targeted, we are absolutely reaching out to our city agencies and asking the degree to which this nonprofit is either already a part of maybe their program design to make sure that we don't have a duplication of benefits, if you will, because we do want to make sure that we're able to disperse as, as many funds, as many organizations that want to assist in our recovery as possible. Um, so we are making sure that we provide those connections. Um, once we talk to our agencies and determine if they're a part of program design or not, then we know how we should proceed with those with the proposals that we receive from nonprofits. But to answer your questions, absolutely, we are looking um, to make sure that we are aligning people together that have similar ideals. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and I, uh, I think we've talked about this in previous hearings. I'm. Um, I am not actually sure what to do with my endorsements because I haven't seen all the projects. Um, so has the um, office been rethinking how we do this? Um, I'm, all of us are being inundated with really amazing, awesome projects. Um, I have very specific criteria for what I want to do, um, but I also want to see everything. Um, before giving them. So is there, are, are you, is the office kind of rethinking how this is going to work so that we are able to give our um, endorsements in a, a strategic way 
um, that aligns with, uh, I just don't want to miss a project that I think would be amazing. So we're continuing to have conversations around that. I think one of the things that I highlighted when we last had this discussion is that uh, waiting for all of the proposals to be provided means um, that we slow down on the ability to disperse funding, um, which means that we provide less time for those organizations, um, whether they're nonprofit or city agencies, to be able to execute once they receive funding and to be able to complete their projects within the time frame that the law allows. So yes, we are con continuing to have those conversations, but there are some trade-offs that go along with that that we need to really think very carefully about to make sure that we don't leave any dollars on the table um, because that's the last thing that we want to do is not be able to yeah, spend all the money you. within the time frame. Um, so right. we're, we're continuing to have those conversations and in, in determining the trade-offs and, and how that would ultimately impact the ability to deliver on the projects that have been proposed. Yes, and, and we've, um, I think you've sent out one round to us. Are you expecting to send out another round to us to look at? Yes, we are planning to do that. Um, so we're happy, but again, as a part of those conversations, um, if we were to to hold on um, not providing additional information to council until we have all of the proposals in, then you wouldn't receive anything anytime soon because we have to wait until the end of the application period. So we'll be in contact over the next several weeks around some decisions around that and how that impacts endorsements. Um, okay, that, that's it for this round. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Director Kearney. Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Director Kearney, again. Uh, when we talk about um, the applications, um, that have been reviewed. Is there a, uh, is it like first come first serve or is there emphasis uh, associated with whatever discipline or whatever uh, bucket it would fall under associated with the mayor's pillars? Uh, applications are reviewed uh, first come first serve. Got you. Um, so there's no way to um, know like how many applications have been reviewed that say address housing insecurity versus how many applications have been reviewed to say address public safety? So we have information that is designated by the expenditure categories, which I shared, and also by the mayor's pillars, which I also shared as a part of this presentation. If you're asking for something more granular outside of those uh, categories, then we, that would take some, some manual work to be able to look at things in that way. But you're just lumping them in based off of those five pillars, right? Lumping them in. They are categorized by the pillars and also by the expenditure categories. Got you. Sorry to play semantics. I kind of see that the same thing, so sorry about that. Um, when we talk about um, housing, um, has there been any discussion of allocating funding supportive of housing for homeless? down payment assistance programs or strengthening city renters assistance program um, inside of uh, the $500 million, basically excluding out the 141 and just looking at the $500 million. Yes, there have been discussions. Can you provide us any information about those discussions? So to date, we have been having discussions with DHCD as well as our other housing partners to figure out um, what would be the best and most strategic use of funds, um, ARPA related, ARPA funding for housing related projects and for homelessness. Um, I don't have project proposal specifics to share, um, but there have been conversations about, again, how best to maximize the money. Um, looking at, again, with an eye on equity and making sure that we are distributing not just dollars, but strategic investment as well as um, housing units and things of that nature across the city and especially in our divested neighborhoods. Has there been an earmarked amount specific to um, ensuring that city residents aren't displaced from the housing or specific to housing insecurity or protection of legacy renters? There has not been an earmark that's been determined at this time. There are still strategic conversations that are continuing between the administration and our housing agencies. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. President. Council colleagues, <clears throat> any other questions? Councilwoman Ramos? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Director Kearney, I was wondering um, 
you you had talked um, about the fact that projects or items that were underfunded prior to COVID would not be um, funded. And I'm wondering if there's any specific example you might be able to provide um, of, of, a, of, of that happening. I'm uh, specifically, you know, obviously uh, uh, my passion is around housing and community development. And so I know that we've, uh, there are um, potentially proposals around housing um, that uh, it's, it's important to make sure that those get funded um, and they haven't been funded because of lack of funding, but because of the tie between the need for housing and what we saw because of COVID, it feels to me like that absolutely needs to be funded. So I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of what, and then back to what my, um, you know, Mr. Chair had talked about in the last meeting around some of our city services not um, necessarily funded properly. But then when COVID hit, there was massive uh, issues with um, some of our services. Um, and so I, I wonder if you can speak a little bit more uh, specifically around this issue of, even if it wasn't properly funded prior to the pandemic, that this money doesn't necessarily um, fund those projects. So I, I want to be clear in, in my statement because I didn't use the terms underfunded versus funded. Um, what I said was that there were clear needs that the city had prior to the pandemic that were further exacerbated by the pandemic and that in order for them to be eligible, we have to be able to show a tie. We have to, whether that's in data um, and not necessarily anecdotally, it's better in data if we're able to demonstrate pre and post pandemic challenges. Um, and so with regard to housing, I think we have to be very careful because we have seen where um, there's only been one finding so far to date where uh, the Treasury has actually asked for repayment. And that is because there was something that was already in the pipeline prior to the pandemic that was already in the city's plans. And then they used some of their federal funding for that purpose. And then Treasury wanted those funds back. Um, so with regard to housing, it becomes a little bit trickier because yes, there are some housing developments that have been in the pipeline for a while and for whatever reason um, have not been able to be, be seen through to completion. Um, talking about that in terms of gap financing becomes very challenging because that's not what the law is for. Um, if we're able to demonstrate in some way that there has, is a tie to the pandemic and there is some issue that further exacerbated the ability to be able to see a housing project into completion, then I think um, we have a stronger case that we can make to Treasury about why we use those funds in that way. Um, so it also sounds like it's a very case by case situation as well, given the circumstances around what, uh, the project itself and how much the pandemic exacerbated the opportunity to complete the project. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, I, I think that's factual. Um, okay. And uh, is there any other sort of specific example of things that could not be funded? Because I mean, it, you know, with 58% only of eligibility, it sounds like there were some agencies who and nonprofits who thought that they, they would be able to um, to have so it qualify, but may, it may be, the project may have been underfunded or not funded or however you want to say it, um, but it doesn't qualify because it wasn't it wasn't something that we could we could fit into the process even though it was underfunded prior to the um, um, to COVID. Another example that I would probably give are efforts around modernization and digitization. Um, we have several agencies that are asking for um, what, what I would consider to be business process improvement. Um, it is different if we are talking about um, IT related solves that keep us from having people physically come into a building, right? So if we're able to, um, to help it, our residents not have to come to municipal buildings to pay bills or do things like that, that would be an investment that we could tie to the pandemic um, because it's keeping people out of congregate settings and things of that nature. 
if it is just a business process that we probably should have implemented long before COVID, that is a different conversation as it pertains to modernizing um, in a, a city agency and some of the services that they provide. So that's probably another example where there is a distinction. I appreciate that example. Thank you. Um, and I, I appreciate you going into detail about that. That was it for me, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Director, do we have a list of the um, of the nonprofit partners that are on that panel um, that's going to be reviewing these? Yes, that was provided in our responses to the last hearing. Okay. So happy to uh, share that with I, you again. If you no, no, no. I got, I got that. I'm sorry. I overlooked that. Um, okay. Let me... Uh, Council Vice President Middleton? Uh, no questions. Colleagues, any other questions? Yeah, I have a couple more. Mr. President. Just from a public health investment perspective, definitely appreciate um, uh, the administration coming out with public, serve, uh, public health uh, investment initially. Um, but what was the decision to allocate funding uh, for the 100 contract tra tracers? Um, you know, basically why 100, and I think it was 20 contract tracers, what was determined? Is this something that's consistent with other cities? Do you know the, the motivation behind that? So, um, again, we sat down with BCHD and talked thoroughly through um, their budget. Um, at the time that we had the conversation, uh, we were still seeing challenges with the number of COVID cases in the city and the ability to be able to do the contract tracing that was necessary. Um, I think if you have more pointed questions about the number, I would direct those to Dr. DeRaza. Um, but I think for our perspective, we just wanted to understand the reason for that number and make sure that it was justifiable based on what the agency was requesting. Um, so basically, basically the agency comes to you and says, hey, contract tracing is important for X, Y, Z reason. It fits inside of this category for X, Y, Z reasons. We need 120, and that's basically how the approval happens. No, that's not. We, again, we sit down with agencies. We look at information and data from their CARES Act spending. Um, we looked at data that the agency was tracking on contract tracing. We talked to um, the agency about shortages that they were having in staff, because as you know, um, there were many people who were double and triple tasked um, as a part of the COVID-19 response. And so in some cases, there was really an opportunity for people to be able to return to their actual day jobs that we hired them to do and keep them out of the field and doing things like contract tracing and other things that were related to the response. So it's not just that we take uh, the agency's um, kind of explanation or, or just whatever they ask us from us, we actually try to validate that information against data that they have already been collecting with regard to contract tracing and uh, the number of staff that they had to do those types of duties. And it was determined that Baltimore City needed 120 contract tracers. Yes, and I think, um, again, if we are to see that the numbers stay low and, and a, a number of other factors that I think BCHD would consider, um, then we would look to allocate that money potentially to some other um, cause, um, for example, boosters. Um, at the time that we created the budget, boosters was not a thing. Um, and so we'll have to be thinking very carefully about the need to reallocate some of those funds, um, potentially towards boosters and those types of vaccinations. Yeah, and in no attempt, I'm trying to oversimplify um, the level of engagement uh, and the, the, the time and sacrifice that your team has to put in in dealing with these agencies, just really trying to get to the root of, you know, how we ultimately are coming up with these numbers. Uh, and so my next question is, like, when we look at 120 tr uh, contract tracers here in the city of Baltimore, um, do we make that determination just basically in a vacuum, um, you know, kind of with all the information you just kind of laid out? Or are we also like staring and comparing what other major me metropolitan areas are doing with the money or, or no? We, we, um, I, how, how does that, that, how does that kind of shake out? Specifically the contract tracers and just everything in general, how does that kind of shake up? So with spe specifically the contract tracers, no, we, we weren't looking at what other metropolitan cities were doing. For some of the other things that we've looked at and are determining um, if there are additional allocations that are needed, yes, we are looking at what other cities are doing and how they're using their funds. Um, we do have consultants that we also talk with um, because they have other city clients that they are also 
uh, consulting for and the use of ARPA funding. And so we engage our consultants and we're also doing our own research around how other cities are using ARPA funding. So we're, we're looking at best practices. We're not making decisions in a vacuum. We're looking at data. We're looking at a variety of different things to help make sound decisions on some of these allocation numbers and investments. Understood. I, I only ask because, you know, some of my partners in other cities, you know, when I bring up things like contract tracing, um, they're not things that they're spending the ARPA dollars on. And not to say that we're doing it right or we're doing it wrong. I was just wondering if that was part of uh, the evaluation. Well, I would also know. note that that CARES Act funding um, at the time that we created the budget was scheduled to end in December of 21. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we still had allocations to continue to do a level of contract tracing that we thought was needed in the city. Um, again, you know, COVID is, is an art and not a science. It, there's there's not really a, a formula that we can plug in. There aren't other five or six other cities that we can look at because no matter what the size of the population is, our numbers can look very different, um, even if we compare ourselves to peer cities. Um, so we we worked with BCHD on that number and are confident in it. Gotcha. I appreciate that. Do we know how many COVID-19 tests uh, the funding um, will provide in like the breakdown of at-home PCR rapid tests? Um, so I know that there's 40,000 COVID-19 tests that are at home testing and through um, mobile vaccination. Um, if you want a further breakdown between at home and mobile, um, I don't have that in front of me, um, but we can get that to you. Gotcha. And how many families and individuals will, will receive meals and food through uh, the investment? I know that that was kind of part of it as well. Is there a targeted number of individuals um, that the city plans to reach? Like, is there an ultimate goal? So I know that the budget for food insecurity is roughly around um, $15 million in that contract with a number of agencies that provide um, on-site delivery, I'm, I'm sorry, on-site delivery of food as well as um, home delivery. Um, for the number targeted, don't have it in front of me, but of course we can follow up. Got you. And, and, and again, I mean, I, I appreciate your time um, and I appreciate all of the, the work that your team, you know, puts into kind of understanding this. I, I guess, um, really the motivation for the council is we just want to look at the information at least disaggregated from a degree level down mm -hmm. you know, how mm -hmm. ultimately the numbers are rolling up um, I kind of equate this process uh, in working with you on a quarterly basis uh, doing these hearings kind of to like a budget process and you know not necessarily showing me what the end number is but how did we ultimately get to that number um, because I think that that's how we work work best together so that's where it is I do have um, another set of questions, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure if there's anybody else with questions I don't want to uh, take up. Um, Mr. President, I'm just, uh, it looks like we have one from Councilwoman Ramos, but real quick, Director, I, I checked through my email and specifically the response that we received on October 15th, and I do not believe that we received a list of the uh, nonprofit members of that panel. Um, I may be mistaken or it may be in another email. Um, would that be something that you can commit to sending over to us by call of business today? Yep. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, Councilwoman Ramos. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to, um, in that same um, report, there was that list of the backlog that uh, the committee had requested. And um, maybe when the city administrator comes, I have some questions specifically about the backlog and this chart. I don't know, Director Kearney, or if the mayor's office can answer this question about, um, you know, the, the top 10 are bolded and what that, what that means. Um, and if any of the, these um, backlog of services is included in any of the um, proposals that you've received. Um, so I'm not prepared to answer that. I do, I am familiar with the chart. I'm, I don't know why the top 10 were bolded. Um, Natasha, I don't know if you can recall that or not. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if we need to follow up, we can certainly do that. Um, and I think, as I mentioned before, it's really going to be on the case by case basis, the, the ability to be able to determine um, how or if we can use ARPA funding for any of these backlog services. Um, it's really going to be in our pre and post um, pandemic data to be able to draw that business case. And so without that information, I'm not able to say with a level of certainty that we can do that. 
Right, but you, um, and you don't know yet which of these is, has been applied for or anything like that. I don't have the chart in front of me. Um, okay. I, I, I'm really appreciative of the mayor's office giving us this chart. It's really great and very interesting. Um, so, uh, so maybe, uh, Mr. Chair, we can make that part of the next, um, to, to dig into this a little bit. Um, thank you very much. Absolutely. Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Director Kearney, um, a lot of, the one thing, uh, one common theme that I've had an issue with, um, and, and, and raised concerns about is how some of the money are creating new positions uh, that aren't sustainable, um, particularly when we talk about I believe over a tenth of ten, over ten percent of the money associated with the initial um, public safety rollout went to like twenty some positions or something that we know at the end of the the, the rainbow, the end of this money um, will be unfunded. Uh, we either we have to rely on the federal government, the state, or somehow find it through our own city coffers to kind of pay for it. Uh, and I know that there's other institution, uh, other instances uh, that will be rolled out. will have the same level of creating these jobs without. Um, having money to kind of pay for them. Um, has there been discussions or are there discussions when we're deciding to create, you know, which I think is up to almost 40 jobs at this point. Um, has there been any discussions on like how we ultimately pay for those jobs or right now the strategy is, hey, we think that this is important. We're going to create this position. Uh, and then in two or three years, we know it's going to probably fizzle away if we don't find external money. Thank you for the question. Um, so just for clarity, these are all GSS positions. Um, so they're grant service positions, which means that all of the people that are hired will understand that once the grant funding is gone, um, that those positions go away. Um, I, I would say that uh, council president, we can't have it both ways. We can't want um, effective implementation of our programmings and funding and not have the people to do it. Um, we understand that even prior to ARPA, we have some of our agencies that were um, understaffed and with this additional funding and with some of these additional responsibilities, it requires additional people. Um, we can't add this level of oversight, compliance. Um, we have both the reporting requirements from the council as well as those from the federal government. Um, we also have people that actually have to implement these programs. Um, and so we can't have it both ways where we want to have efficient and effective programs and services and not have the people that are there to do it. So I do understand the concern, of course, about um, having a, a, a large number of staff that are coming on for these positions, but I would argue that we need the personnel and the human capital to be able to make sure that we get a return on investment with the money that we are investing in these programs. Um, and please know that uh, Budget Director Sinemi has certainly um, been involved in those conversations. Um, we do not want to create a fiscal cliff for the city where we have a number of staff that we cannot fund through the general fund, which is why these are GSS positions. And, and we're aware that that we don't have the ability to keep all of these people on once ARPA funding is gone. I would also state that Baltimore is not unique in that situation. Um, all cities and states who are implementing ARPA funds are going to bring on additional staff that they may not be able to continue to hire um, post ARPA. So we're not unique in that challenge, but certainly it is something that we consider is something that we talk about with our agency directors around sustainability. But the truth is this is, as we've talked about, this is a shot in the arm. That shot in the arm means that it's this and then it's gone. And so for our staff, as well as for our services, all of those things are going to see a decline once ARPA funding is gone, unless we have a, a huge change in the city in terms of revenues to be able to sustain these things post ARPA. No, I, I understand that. And one, I'm not suggesting that we kind of have it both ways. I think um, what you said in many of the comments you said, it kind of sits at the core of my concern, particularly when we talk about public safety. Um, the issue of public safety in the city is that we've always taken this kind of like shot in the arm approach, um, particularly when we're dealing with vulnerable populations, uh, folks who are just returning home, folks who have literally uh, been populations of disinvestment, folks who have no connectivity to government and no trust in government. And my concern is particularly when we talk about public safety and the almost two dozen jobs that we have directly tied into that, is that great, we set up an amazing program for two years, maybe three years, 
and then it fizzles and kind of goes away. I think that this really sits at the core of what the council has been saying about not just spending money, but really invest in the money. And I know that many of the, 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 the issues that we're bringing up are major challenges and things that we have to figure out ways of investing in. But if we're taking the shot of injection in our arm, to, your, to, to, to lack of a better term, just what you said, and we're putting in programs that we know are going to have to fizzle away for critical needs, that's literally just spending the money and not investing in something that's going to have a true return. Um, how the individuals that have the ability to kind of flow through that program, I think that there's one where we're, we want to eventually set up some jobs for individuals, but they go away in like 18 months or whatever. I'm, I'm not sure the, you know, all the information there. It, to me, I, I seem like it's further exacerbating that distrust. It's further creating a bigger gap. It's further um, uh, uh, trying to doubling down on things that we've done in the past. Um, and I know that that is not the motivation of the administration at all. Uh, um, and I know that these things have probably been factored. Um, but again, at the core of your response is really what my concern is about very sensitive items um, when we talk about public safety and we talk about um, connecting with folks who feel completely disenfranchised with the system. So to respond to those comments, I would say that if you speak with uh, Director Jackson, um, who is wholeheartedly invested in public safety and making sure that we have jobs and resources available to returning citizens and others that are justice involved, um, that we have to start somewhere. Um, and so we have to be able to provide a level of basic um, services to these individuals and jobs as part of it. Um, we don't have enough money to sustain jobs for everyone for a lengthy period of time, but our hope is that beginning in, with this first step and beginning with this investment will then lead to further investment, whether that's from the federal, from our nonprofit partners or from philanthropic community. Um, but it at least gives some of our returning citizens a shot. It gives them an opportunity to develop some workforce development skills. Um, it gives them opportunities to maybe develop skills that they did not have prior to incarceration or being justice involved. And so we have to start somewhere. I think if we take the position that unless it can be sustained, we don't want to do it, then we fail our residents that really need us. Yeah, no, and I, I, I again, I don't want to play semantics with you. I, I guess what I'm saying is, um, an idea of not spending the money, but investing the money. So there's programs out there that have empirical data, that have staffing, um, but then also have um, resource issues, right? Uh, so w what I'm trying to say is not necessarily the jobs that we're creating for the returning citizens, but the jobs that we're creating to set up programs for the returning citizens to have temporary employment uh, for those 18 months. So I guess that's the core of where, where I'm getting at. Um, and again, I know that these are very complicated decisions. I'm not trying to say that your job or the agency jobs is easy. Um, I just want us to always lean towards um, some type of, of lens of sustainability through investment um, and not spending. And that cannot always be the case, and I understand that. Um, but um, just when I start to look at some of the initial numbers and we are maybe not even the third way through the spending of the money, the amount of jobs that we're creating uh, to try to create some of these programs, that's just where the concern kind of brought, has brought up and something that I'll continue to kind of look into and um, uh, ask you about and talk to you about. Um, how much grant funding um, and contracts will be awarded to community-based organizations? Do we know that answer yet? So I think that's on a program design basis and that's contingent upon our agencies. So our office worked with agencies on the allocation that was needed. Um, I know that each of our agencies have um, some ideas behind the amount of grants that they would give out and the number of grants, but I don't have that total in front of me. Understood. Um, so and and I'm not, I'm really not trying to put you on the spot. If you don't know it, I, I really just, uh, it's fine. Do we know how much um, money out of that $50 million for say like the public safety will be dedicated to uh, community-based organizations? So that that's another one that requires a little bit of, of math. Yeah, okay, um, it's fine. Yeah, all right. If you could um, 
you know, and I think also based sometimes we can kind of work offline if we have some of these that, uh, direct questions. Mm -hmm. um, the only other thing is the individuals, like some of the individual community organizations that are going to ultimately be awarded some of that money, say specific to the $50 million from a Muncie perspective, can they also reapply through the other portal process? And if so, is the fact that they are receiving money through some of the mayor's directed money, does that, is that, is that something that kind of goes against them? Are, are they, are they um, uh, kind of uh, coached into or suggested that they not apply? Or are they just kind of one out of the hundreds that you receive and just based off of the merits of whatever they're bringing to the table will determine if they um, will ultimately get awarded through the portal process. So CBOs can apply directly to agencies for their grants, or they can apply to the mayor's office for um, for grants directly from the mayor's office of recovery programs. Um, we would be very cautious about organizations that are double dipping, if you will, to make sure that if they are applying both to an agency and to the mayor's office of recovery programs, that they are applying for different purposes. Um, if they are using the funding for the same thing, we would consider that a duplication of benefits. Got it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Director Kearney. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, any other questions? Uh, just a, a statement, Mr. Ch Chair. Um, just to piggyback on one of the pieces that our president was talking about and as far as um, jobs and um, uh, trying to seek permanent jobs and career focused career training jobs is the path that we all should be focused on and not uh, you know again we're reimagining our city and not doing the same things over and over and over. That's always the easy way out, and we have to just really stop doing that. There's, um, um, we, we, wanna, we want our city to stay on the progressive curve of staying in, updated with all of the other cities nationwide, and one way to do that is as we hire people and we, you know, we comfortably say they're temporary, we shouldn't say that. We should be also forward thinking and trying to get those people we hired to keep them and, and continue that training and moving them through government with ever expertise they're learning while they're in that position. So um, I just wanted to kind of reiterate that um, that's, I know that's the focus that the council continues to stay on. That's why we constantly push apprenticeship programs and things like that within government. Um, just wanted to make that, reiterate that statement. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Colleagues, any other questions? All right, thank you all. Uh, director, um, look forward to receiving that, that list of the folks uh, on the nonprofit review board. Forgive my terminology, I don't know if I said that exactly correct, but we're on the same page there. And we will uh, certainly be in touch um, as we lead up to the next quarterly oversight hearing as to whether or not uh, we would like for the, the CAO or any specific agency officials uh, to uh, appear before the committee. Uh, so with that, uh, we are now in recess. Thank you. Thank you.